Hi, I'm Amy. Today we're going to look at modelling relationships between different animal populations. And we're going to look specifically at competitive exclusion, which is where we have two different populations that are competing for the same resources. We're going to look at red and grey squirrels. And red squirrels have actually become endangered since grey squirrels were introduced in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. So we kind of want to see them survive over the grey squirrels. We're going to let U represent the red squirrels and we're going to let V represent the grey squirrels. And these might seem like kind of weird letters to use, but they're just ones that we commonly use when we're doing population modelling. And I'm going to try to draw, draw a squirrel as well, which might not go so well. Maybe that kind of looks like a squirrel. And then, as I said, we've got V being the grey squirrels. And I'm also going to try to draw maybe a slightly better squirrel than last time. And now what we want to be able to do is we want to model how these populations are going to change over time, so how U and V both change over time. And we want these both to depend on their own population size and the population size of the other type of squirrel as well. So this is how the red squirrels change over time. And I'll go into a bit more detail in a minute about what all of the terms mean. And now for the grey squirrels. And this is where alpha, beta and gamma are all going to be constant parameters. So we can expand this out. And we can collect the terms that just have u's in and then have u's and v's in together. And we can do obviously do exactly the same for the v term as well. So both these terms represent logistic growth, which means that the larger a population is, the faster it will grow, which makes intuitive sense because the more squirrels we have, the more squirrels we have reproducing. And so the faster the population size is going to increase. Um, but this only increases up to a certain point, And then we're going to see that we have a lack of resources which means that the population size is going to decrease again. And this point that we hit where there are then not enough resources for the population to carry on increasing is called the carrying capacity. And now these other terms we've got, these UV terms, show how the population of red and grey squirrels affects each other. And each UV term has got a negative coefficient in front of it. So the presence of red squirrels decreases the grey squirrel population and vice versa. And so those terms represent our competitive exclusion. There are four possible outcomes for our squirrels. So first of all, we have that the red squirrels survive and the gray squirrels die out and they go extinct. Secondly, we have that the reverse of that. So we have that the gray squirrels survive and the red squirrels go extinct. And then thirdly, we could have that both populations die out. So the red and gray squirrels both go extinct. And then finally, we can have that they both coexist, which is where they both survive together. So we want to find our steady states, which means that we want to find the points where the population settles i.e. the rate of change of the population of both the red and the grey squirrels is equal to zero. So d u over dt is equal to zero and dv over dt is equal to zero. And we can set d u over dt equal to zero first. And we can just set the equation for d u over dt to be equal to zero. And by looking at this we can see that either u is equal to zero or we can get that if the other bracket's zero, then u is equal to one minus alpha v. Now we can set dv over dt equal to zero as well, similarly to du over dt, and plug in the equation for dv over dt. So here we can get that v is equal to zero, or we can get that v is equal to one minus beta times u. And now what we actually want to find is the points where both du over dt and dv over dt are equal to zero. So if we take u is equal to zero, then we can plug that into the equation from before. And first of all, we could see that v equals zero would work and we still get dv over dt equals zero. So we get zero, zero is our first steady state. Or we could look at the second bracket and we can get v is equal to one. So we get zero, one is our second steady state. And then similarly, we set v equal to zero, plug that into the one at the top. And we can either get u is equal to zero, which gives us the one we already had, or we can get u is equal to one. So we get one zero as our third steady state. And then finally, what we want to look at is when u is equal to one minus alpha v. And we can plug that into the equation at the bottom. And then if you do a bit of rearranging, then what we actually find that we get is that we've got a final steady state at one minus alpha over one minus alpha times beta, then one minus beta over one minus alpha times beta. And the important thing to bear in mind with this one is that because all of our steady states must be positive for them to be physically realistic. So it doesn't make sense to have a negative population size. Then we actually only get that the steady state exists when either we have alpha greater than one and beta greater than one, 
or alpha less than one and beta less than one. And if we think back to the different possibilities that we said we had for our populations, we can see that zero, zero represents where both the populations die out. Zero, one represents where the red population dies out and the greys survive. One, zero is where the red population survives and the greys die out. And then the final one is where they're both coexisting. Now we've found our steady states, what we want to look at is whether they're stable or unstable. And to get an idea of what that actually means, we can kind of think about if you have a boulder and if you put it at the top of a hill, then if you pushed it to either side, it would fall away from our steady state and it wouldn't come back. And so that's kind of the idea of what an unstable steady state is. Whereas if we sat the boulder at the bottom of a valley, so like at the bottom of a big dip, then if we pushed it to either side, it would fall back down again to our steady state. And so that's kind of what a stable steady state is like. We also want to know what happens near each steady state, as once our population gets very close to the steady state, we don't expect the behaviour to change all that much. And so we're going to do something called linear stability analysis, which is when we look at what happens very, very close to our steady states and we examine the behaviour. We've got the expressions for du over dt and dv over dt written here as a reminder, and then we've just set du over dt equal to x as a function of u and v, and dv over dt equal to y as a function of u and v. And that's just to make our notation a bit easier as we go through this. So what we want to do is we want to look at what happens a small distance from our steady state. So we're going to set u equal to u naught plus u tilde, and we're going to set v equal to v naught plus v tilde, where we're going to have that u naught v naught is equal to our steady state. So those are the values that we worked out last time where du over dt equals zero and dv over dt equals zero. And then the u tilde and v tilde are gonna just be small distances. So that means that these two points are just a small distance away from our steady states. And now what we want to do is we want to look at du over dt and dv over dt at these points. And so we're just gonna plug in for u and v into our expression for x. And then what we can do is we can use Taylor's expansion on this to write out the first few terms. So the small u and small v, the subscripts, represent the derivative with respect to that. So it's a partial derivative with respect to either u or v. And then the line represents that we're going to evaluate that derivative at our steady state u0, v0. And then obviously the v1 means the same. So we've got our x expression differentiated with respect to v and then evaluated at our steady state u0, v0. And obviously there'd be further terms in this, but they'd be of order u tilde squared, v tilde squared, and because they're small distances, they're gonna be getting very small at that point, so we've chosen to ignore those. And now we can do pretty much identical thing for dv over dt, and we can write it in terms of y. And now what we want to spot here is we want to actually spot that these x and y's evaluated at u0 and v0 are gonna be equal to zero because that's exactly how we defined our steady states and how we found them last time. So they're actually gonna disappear. And so the final expression that we get left with if we ignore everything that's been set to zero is we get du tilde over dt is equal to u tilde x with respect to u evaluated at u0 v0 plus v tilde x vector v evaluated at u0 v0. And what we can actually do to write that a lot more neatly is we can write it in terms of matrices and vectors, which if you expand those out, then you actually just get the expressions that we just came up with. And to make it even more simple, we can call our vector u tilde v tilde z and then we can call z dot the derivative with respect to t and then we can call our matrix with our partial derivatives in it m and so we can express it as z dot so d over dt of z is equal to m times z and what we want to do is solve the equation and the way that we want to find those is by taking our matrix m and we want to find something called an eigenvalue of m the way that we do that is we want to find the values of lambda that will set the determinant of m minus lambda times i, where i is the identity matrix equal to zero. And so it's those values of lambda that are called eigenvalues. And so we're going to find two eigenvalues, lambda 1 and lambda 2. And the reason that this works is that we find an expression for z of t, which is equal to a constant times a vector times by e to the power of our eigenvalue times t and then we also get that again for our second eigenvalue and using this expression of z you can plug that back into dz over dt we see that we get that that expression works so now let's look back at our model of red and gray squirrels and what we want to do is we want to calculate our m matrix for this and what we actually call the m matrix is the jacobian that's what we commonly call it 
So what we need to do is we need to work out the derivative of x with respect to u. So we're basically leaving any term with a v as a constant. So the first bit where we have u times 1 minus u, we can differentiate that with respect to u quite easily and we get 1 minus 2u. And then the minus alpha v times u, if we differentiate with respect to u, we just get minus alpha v. And then if we can do that with respect to v, we get minus alpha u because it's just that minus alpha uv term that's got a v in it. And then we can also do the same for the y of u and v as well. And so this is our Jacobian for our model that we're working with. And so we obviously also need to evaluate this at our steady states. That's the thing that we haven't done. And so we need to work through our different steady states. So let's start with 0, 0. So at 0, 0, so that's u equals 0 and v equals 0, we find that our Jacobian is going to be equal to 1, 0, 0, gamma. And that's just by plugging those values in. And now what we need to work out is the values of lambda for which the determinant of m minus lambda i is equal to 0. And so when we find the determinant of that matrix, we're going to do the two terms on the first diagonal times together. So that's 1 minus lambda times by gamma minus lambda. And then the two terms on the other diagonal to 0. So we just want to set that equal to 0. And we can easily see the solution to this are lambda equals 1 or lambda is equal to gamma. Because gamma must be positive for the equation for dv over dt to make sense, then we see that both of these are going to be greater than 0. And they're also both clearly real as well. So we can actually classify the steady state and we can say that it's going to be something called an unstable node. And we'll see what that looks like in a little bit. Okay, so we've found our Jacobian for 0, 0 and we find that we always get an unstable node. And now we want to look at some of our other steady states as well. So we'll start by looking at 0, 1. We just need to plug in our values again to find our Jacobian. And again, we just want to work out the determinant of this and set it equal to 0 and find the values of lambda that make it equal to 0. And again, because we have a 0 in one of our diagonals, it's quite easy to work out what the determinant is equal to. So we can solve this and we see that we get that our first eigenvalue, lambda 1, is equal to alpha minus 1 and lambda 2 is going to be equal to minus gamma. And so now we have different cases. So we can have a look at if alpha is greater than 1, then we see that our lambda 1 is going to be greater than 0 and our lambda 2 is going to be less than 0. And so where we have this where lambda 2 is less than 0, lambda 1 is greater than 0, that means that we get a saddle point. A saddle is both unstable and stable, but it's only stable in one very specific direction, and so overall we actually classify that as an unstable steady state. And now we need to think about what happens when alpha is less than 1 as well. Then we can see that lambda 1 is going to be negative and lambda 2 is going to be negative, and so in this case we're going to get a stable node, and the stable node is obviously classed as stable. And now we just need to do the same for our 1, 0 steady state. And the calculations are very similar for this one. And so we get lambda 1 is equal to minus 1 and lambda 2 is equal to gamma times beta minus 1. And again, we need to look at cases, but this time for beta and whether beta is greater than 1 or less than 1. So if beta is greater than 1, then we see that we get that lambda 1 is going to be less than 0 and lambda 2 is going to be greater than 0. And so same as before, we're going to get a saddle point for this one which, as I mentioned, is going to be unstable. And then we also need to just look at what happens when beta is less than 1. So in this case, we're going to get that lambda 1 is, of course, again, less than 0, and lambda 2 is going to be less than 0 as well. And so we've got two real eigenvalues less than 0, and so we get a stable node. And now, finally, we only have one steady state left to look at to see what happens. And that's our slightly more complicated steady state where they coexist. We've got 1 minus alpha over 1 minus alpha times beta and 1 minus beta over 1 minus alpha times beta. And if you remember from before, we saw that we can only have this steady state existing in two cases. And that's where alpha is less than 1 and beta is less than 1 or where alpha is greater than 1 and beta is also greater than 1. And that's because they need to be positive, the steady state values. Otherwise, they're physically unrealistic. We can use some complicated algebra here. You can give it a go yourself as well. We work out in exactly the same way. It's just slightly more complicated. And what we find is in the first case, we're going to get that lambda 1 is less than 0 and lambda 2 is greater than 0. And so we see a saddle point. And in the second case, where both alpha and beta are greater than 1, we're going to get that lambda 1 and lambda 2 are both less than 0. And so in this case, we're going to get a stable node. Now we've classified each of our four steady states, we can plot a phase portrait to understand how they're all going to fit together. So the first thing we want to do when we're drawing a phase portrait is we want to look for something called a null cline, which is where we set du over dt equal to zero, or we set dv over dt equal to zero. It's kind of similar to a steady state, apart from the fact we don't need both of them to be equal to zero. Instead of points, we're going to get lines instead. So from the first one being equal to zero, we're going to get u equals zero or u equals one minus alpha v. 
And for the second one, we're going to get v equals zero, or v is equal to one minus beta times u. And we're only going to see that these two that I've just underlined, they're only going to intercept, so cross over where we have alpha less than one, beta less than one, or where we have alpha greater than one and beta greater than one. And the reason for this is that the intersections of our null clines are where we get steady states. And that kind of makes sense because the intersections where we have du over dt equals zero and dv over dt equals zero. And so those two, the u equals one minus alpha v and the v equals one minus beta u are only going to intercept where we have our fourth steady state existing. And that only happened where alpha was less than one and beta was less than one or alpha and beta were both greater than one. So we're going to start by plotting the phase portrait for alpha and beta both less than one. So first of all, we're going to plot on our null clines. And we've got our four steady states. The other intersections that you can see, so the points where the lines sort of cross each other, is where the null clines, but from the same equation, intercept. So where both u equals zero and u equals one, one minus alpha v intercept, for example, is just both telling us that du over dt equals zero. So that doesn't count as a steady state where they intercept. And so we have zero, zero, which we know is an unstable node. So the lines are going to be moving away from that one. And then we knew that zero, one was going to be a stable node. So we see the lines going into there. And then the same for one, zero is also a stable node. So the lines are moving into that one. And what we actually see that we can see the saddle point at the point one minus alpha over one minus alpha beta, one minus beta over one minus alpha beta, because the lines are kind of coming into it and then moving away. And that's what a saddle point looks like. And so we see that we actually have this dashed line between the line u equals v and where if we sit above that line we're going to move towards the steady state zero one and if we're below that line we're going to move towards the state one zero and so it actually matters what our initial population was now let's do alpha and beta both greater than one so again we get the same null clines as before so we can plot those on and now we're still going to have that zero zero is an unstable node but this time we're going to have that our coexisting steady state is going to be a stable node. And so all of our lines are traveling in towards that one. And we also see that our zero one or one zero steady states are unstable. So it's traveling away from those. And what we can see in this case is it doesn't actually depend on your initial population anymore. Wherever we started, we're always going to end up with the two populations coexisting. So we end up with both red and gray squirrels. Now let's look at what happens when we have alpha greater than one, beta less than one. And as I mentioned before, this means that we don't get our coexisting steady state. We just either have both dying out, one surviving or the other one surviving. And in this case, we had that our zero one steady state was the stable one. And so we see that wherever we start, regardless of our initial population, we're gonna see that the gray squirrel is going to survive and the red squirrel is going to be the ones that die out. And then last but not least, we've got our alpha greater than one and beta greater than one. And so we get very similar null clients to the one we just did. But in this case, we're going to have that it's our one zero steady state that's stable. And so we're going to see that our lines travel in towards that one. So we actually get a stable node for one zero and an unstable node for the other two steady states. So that was a quick run through of how to plot phase portraits. And hopefully you can see how useful they are in kind of visualizing what's going on with our population and what can happen when we have different parameter values in our model at the start. Bye.